Welcome, everybody. Dihi Bakorja. Welcome to this webinar on language in a health crisis navigating COVID-19 in a multilingual Ireland. This is the 11th in our series of webinars in the Moore Institute in response to the pandemic. Previous sessions can be viewed on our YouTube channel and the links are available on the Moore Institute website. Uh, my name is Daniel Carey. I'm director of the Moore Institute. I'm grateful as ever to David Kelly for hosting Behind the Scenes. Our chair today is Dr. Laura McLaughlin, who is in the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures at NUI Galway and in the discipline of Italian. So Laura, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dan. And thank you everybody for joining us today and welcome to our webinar, which is part of the CALM lecture series. So I'm Laura McLaughlin, I'm uh, the Joint Director of uh, CALM, the Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism at NUI Galway. And uh, the other director is Dr. John Walsh, who will start off today's session. I would also like to welcome those who are listening to us on Flirt FM, because we are also live on Flirt FM today. Um, before we start, I wish to thank the Moore Institute at NUI Galway for uh, facilitating the webinar, and in particular the director, uh, Professor Daniel Carey, who is with us today, as you've just seen, and also has kindly agreed to take over from me should my internet fail, you never know. <laughs> so the title of the webinar today is Language in a Health Crisis, Navigating COVID uh, in a Multilingual Ireland. And why this um, webinar? Because since the coronavirus emergency hit our um, daily lives, a lot has been said about uh, how it has affected society in general and smaller communities in particular. Um, from a medical, a financial, a psychological point of view, among others. But today, in line with the mission of our Center for Applied Linguistics and Multilingualism, we propose to focus on the linguistic and social linguistic challenges posed by COVID-19, particularly in relation to Irish and uh, immigrant languages. So today we have four panelists who promise a very stimulating webinar, exploring the role of the state in uh, providing public health information in languages other than English, um, issues raised by the crisis for uh, speech and language therapy services, and EAL, or English as an additional language provision, but also not just the challenges, but the opportunities that have emerged in terms of um, home language maintenance and language learning. So I will now introduce the four panelists who um, um, will uh, start with uh, uh, Dr. John Walsh. But um, I just wish to explain that we will have the four speakers first, and then we will take questions for approximately 20 minutes. You can write your questions in uh, the chat, and I will then relate them to the speakers. And please um, write who the question refers to. So we will start with Dr. John Walsh, who is going to discuss monolingualism and the Irish state, the challenges of multilingual health information during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, Dr. John Walsh is the co-director of CALM and is also a senior lecturer in Irish in the School of Languages, Literatures and Cultures. After John, Dr. Stanislava Antoniewicz, again from NUI Galway, will talk about changes in language exposure due to COVID-19 what are the potential effects for immigrant languages and for Irish. Dr. Antoniewicz joined the discipline of speech and language therapy at NUI Galway in, uh, 2016, in 2006. Sorry. The third speaker is Annie Asgard from Clada National School, who will present the challenges and surprising benefits of teaching remotely, working with developing multilingual primary school students during the COVID-19 school closure. Annie Asgard is an English language support teacher at the Clada National School in Galway City. And finally, as the last speaker will be Dr. Cassie Smith Christmas, who will give us a snapshot of language and family life during the COVID-19 crisis. Dr. Smith Christmas is a Marie Curie Action Fellow with the project Language, Families and Societies. So John, if you're ready now, we can start with you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Laura, and uh, good afternoon. Um, I'll be speaking today about the pandemic and the monolingual state, with particular emphasis on Irish, but also on other languages as well. 
So at the beginning of March, when the pandemic was starting to spread, the Council of Europe warned that public health information about coronavirus was not being disseminated systematically by the authorities in minority languages. The Council, which is responsible for the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, said that it had noticed that information and guidelines about COVID-19 were frequently not published in minority languages of member states. The question of the Charter and Irish is complex. The Irish government refused to sign it because of the fact that Irish is constitutionally not a minority language. But the Council's statement led me to begin thinking about a fundamental question for anyone who cares about language and social justice. Are speakers of minority languages, in the broadest sense of the term, those who speak a language which is in a minority position? Are such people being informed in those languages about the pandemic by the authorities? And how are Irish speakers and speakers of immigrant languages being treated in this regard? So since the COVID-19 restrictions came into place, I saw every centimetre, first of the two kilometre limit and then the five kilometre limit. The bright yellow signs all over Galway were almost entirely in English, those erected by the City Council and others with the logos of the government and the health service executive. One day on Air Square, I counted 22 COVID-19 signs in English only, some of them standing brazenly in the centre of the park and others on bus stops or hanging from lampposts. According to what I heard from others, the same applied in many parts of the country, although there seemed to be some bilingual signage in the Gaeltacht. My survey is not scientific, but the forest of English only signs got me thinking again about the social status of the Irish language and the state's attitude to it. As we know, Ireland is officially a bilingual state and there are statutory obligations on state bodies to erect bilingual signage under the Official Languages Act 2003. Of course, the country is also unofficially multilingual with over 60 languages counted in Galway alone in the last census. An excellent book by the Israeli sociolinguist Elana Shohami, Hidden uh, Language Policy, Hidden Agendas and New Approaches, distinguishes between the overt language policy that which is declared and codified, and the covert language policy, the real story behind the bluster and the rhetoric. Language policy operates at both levels, and in order to understand it completely, we need to consider the two. We can call the covert policy the real policy, because it's the one in which most people believe, even if they don't say so when asked. Ireland is an excellent example of this split. On the one hand, we have a first official and national language with limited protection in terms of state services. But on the other hand, it's very hard for someone to do their business in Irish with the state. The Official Languages Act is the legislation that regulates the use of Irish in public life, and signage is the most obvious manifestation of that. It's no surprise that signage attracts the, a, a large number of complaints every year to the Irish language commissioner. Because the provisions of the Act are quite weak, many of the duties imposed on public bodies are limited to that very visible realm, which can be achieved by outsourcing text for translation. As yet, we have no rules about the recruitment of bilinguals to the public service, an essential part of a bilingual public administration. And the monolingual COVID-19 signage all over the country shows that we can't even implement the most basic and limited duties mandated by the Act. Since the restrictions were announced, Irish has also been marginalised in other areas, for instance, public health information online. The website gov.ie is almost entirely in English, and when the five stages to reopening the country were announced, there was no sign of them in Irish. Yesterday, the Irish version of gov.ie still contained information about phase two, yet we have known for some time that phase, two was, phase three rather, was coming last Monday. The HSE website isn't much better. There are far fewer resources about COVID-19 in Irish, and they're scattered throughout the, reps, the website rather than centralised. There are plenty of different ways of accessing information in English, guides, videos, audio resources, banners, and social media graphics, but no sign of anything comparable in Irish. The information published in 23 immigrant languages, from Albanian to Yoruba, appears more organised. However, two, immigrants right, two immigrant rights organisations, Together Ireland and the Migrant and Refugee Rights Centre, complained that the HSE multilingual information is inadequate and published their own set of videos in 30 languages. When neither Irish speakers nor speakers of other languages are happy, there is something seriously wrong with the HSE language policy. In March, the government issued a booklet about COVID-19 to every household in the country. A month later, an Irish version arrived, a clear breach of the Official Languages Act. 
which means that all male shots should be bilingual. Of course, this was manna from heaven for the critics of Irish. The radio station News Talk, not renowned for its support for Irish, expressed outrage at the alleged waste of public resources, but never asked the government why it breached the legislation. The Irish Examiner claimed that the booklet was proof that we needed a dose of common sense instead of idealism. In other words, that everything should be in English only. The same problem applies to advertising, an important aspect of the information campaign about COVID-19. There are frequent full page adverts in the national press about the latest health advice, but there's no need for an Irish version because advertising was left out of the regulations linked to the Official Languages Act. There are repeated broadcasts on every radio station in the country outlining the health measures, except on Radio Nogueltochte. Health information ads on TG Cahir are in English for the most part. The daily press conferences are in English only, unless the unfortunate TG Cahir reporter manages to squeeze a line in Irish out of one of the public health doctors. As Taoiseach Leo Varadkar was partial to the coup le focal, and other political leaders have done likewise during the pandemic, but there is rarely more than just that, a tokenistic use of Irish. The outgoing Minister for Health, Simon Harris, was praised for issuing a rare tweet in Irish, but instead should have been asked why his department has issued so little information in Irish or indeed in other languages. Interactive services can be included in this litany of failure. In May, the Language Commissioner issued an investigation into the failure of the Department of Education to provide an Irish version of the Leaving Cert portal to calculate grades. Monolingual information in multilingual settings is not limited to Ireland. We have evidence from Spain and Canada that the majority language has been to the fore in public health information about COVID-19. In Ireland, the experience since March leads me to believe that the real language policy, the real language policy is even clearer than I thought. Irish is somewhat of an irritant that impedes public communication at a time of crisis instead of being the first official language of the state. And instead of planning systematically so that public health information is issued simultaneously in both languages, Irish is often forgotten. Irish language organisations such as Conor na Gaelge or the Language Commissioner have intervened to remind public bodies of their obligations, but therein lies the rub. The obligations are in black and white, but the power of the Commissioner to implement them is limited. There is a commitment in the Programme for Government to enact a revised official languages bill by the end of the year, which would strengthen the provisions. But with no sign of an end to COVID-19, the question of public health information in Irish needs to be addressed in the new legislation. Interactive communication systems, online information in various formats, public service advertisements and government social media accounts, they all should be included. They're all more important to the general public than translations of annual reports of interest to very few. There's also a compelling case for better coordination of information in other languages so that it is more appropriate and accessible for the target audience, many of whom may have limited English, or in the case of marginalised populations, may have issues with literacy. And indeed, literacy is an issue in any minority language, whether it's Irish or a language that is not widely spoken in a given setting. However, there's a bigger cultural problem of the ideology of the monolingual public administration, as the state, founded at least partly on the restoration of its own minority language, approaches its 100th birthday. The last century is scattered with reports about the Irish language thrown aside because they had no legal basis. The Official Languages Act is not perfect, but it at least uh, offers a framework that can be improved upon. Although the new minister, Catherine Martin, is a competent person and a fluent Irish speaker, Gaeltacht has been lumped in with five other large policy areas in her very unwieldy department, so it remains to be seen if the new government will follow through on its promise about new legislation. That will depend in part on public attitudes, and a challenge for the Irish-speaking minority is to convince others of the needs for change, perhaps drawing on evidence from the many creative and dynamic community initiatives around Irish. There's also the question of whether the political establishment would vote for strengthened legislation which would dismantle the real language policy after so long, but in life after COVID-19, all sorts of interesting things are possible. Thank you very much. Gormil Mahagif. Thank you, John, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about that. Uh, we'll move on now to Dr. Stanislava Antoniewicz. Sasha, if you're ready. Uh, I am not able to start my video because the host, okay. 
Uh, that should be, is it working now? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I uh, am, uh, just, just to kind of clarify, I am going to look at uh, this uh, topic from the point of view of uh, psycholinguistics, uh, let's say. Uh, and although I am associated with the, the discipline of speech and language therapy, uh, my education is actually through psychology and I come from cognitive psychology and psycholinguistics. Um, we all know when we talk about uh, multiple languages and multilingualism or bilingualism, we all know that uh, what is critical for acquiring language is language exposure. So if we are not exposed to a language, we can't acquire it. Uh, there is lots of research that looked into language exposure, of course, in monolingual children, but uh, in particular with uh, multilingual children. And we now know that both quality of that exposure and quantity of exposure contribute to the level of language acquired by children. Uh, quality of exposure can be looked, uh, sorry, uh, quantity of exposure can be looked at uh, cumulatively, so from birth, how much of that language uh, a child was exposed to. And uh, also it's important to look at current language exposure, because we can have a situation where, let's say, a child grew up in a predominantly Irish-speaking uh, family, but then they, so they had quite high exposure to Irish, and then they started to go to bilingual or English uh, dominant uh, school. And so current exposure then to Irish will be much different from the cumulative exposure to Irish. So a qu uh, quantity of exposure, how much a time the child uh, is exposed to that language is one factor. But another really important factor that more and more uh, studies highlight is uh, quality of that language exposure. So uh, it is not the same of uh, whether you get, let's say, uh, directions from your parent, um, sit there, eat your dinner, change, go to bed, uh, be quiet, uh, play with your siblings, or whether you are exposed to um, uh, let's say long reach conversations, readings together, um, discussing things together, being involved uh, in, in discussions, and then later on, uh, importantly, through school, uh, being um, offered higher level of language, which uh, refers to more complex syntax, larger vocabulary, um, uh, richer uh, morphosyntactic forms. Uh, so both uh, uh, quantity and quality of exposure contribute to the language that, that children acquire. Um, that was uh, taken care of to, to quite a, a degree through schooling um, in, in, well, uh, uh, either for, for English, if we talk about Ireland, or for Irish through, through Irish immersion schools. Uh, and what we call heritage languages, which sometimes are called immigrant languages in Ireland, um, the children usually acquire at home and usually don't, uh, are not schooled through that language and don't achieve as high level uh, of proficiency in that language as the language that they are school schooled through. What happens now, suddenly comes COVID, schools close, children don't spend time in, in the school environment, in English speaking environment, but they stay at home with their parents and then parents uh, either speak uh, their heritage language, which means that exposure to the heritage language suddenly jumps up and uh, heritage language is really benefited from, from uh, this situation of children staying at home more than um, the time they spend at school. Uh, or uh, another thing is, of course, all of the parents, uh, immigrant parents, and I was talking to several 
um, school teachers, principals, uh, English uh, second language teachers, uh, immigrant parents are really worried about their children not being at school and not having the, the adequate exposure to, to English. So they start uh, speaking English to children. They try to help children with their homework and so on. Um, the, the, the thing with that is that uh, there are lots of studies that showed that what is uh, really important is the level of language um, in child-directed speech. So, uh, of course, the, the, the best possible, uh, and we can see that in, in uh, measuring children's performance in language, is uh, that children are exposed to native speakers. Um, and not necessarily direct one, I mean, it, it can be direct one-to-one -one language speakers, but also uh, native speakers in the community. And that brings the richness of, of language, which uh, then makes child's language uh, rich. Uh, so what happens at, in homes of, of immigrant families, but I think that uh, that also refers to children who live in English uh, speaking, uh, or homes that are dominantly English speaking and dominantly English speaking areas in Ireland they have the similar issue of now not being exposed to Irish uh, at school, but being exposed to Irish by, um, uh, uh, by parents who are not uh, proficient and uh, not native speakers, or might be to, to a different extent. Uh, and that actually changes the quality of exposure. Of course, we have the whole range there, um, but uh, the, the less proficient parents are, uh, the, the less benefit that would uh, have for, for children. Uh, another issue that is related to staying at home a lot, and I think that that will be uh, mainly, uh, uh, possibly mentioned in the uh, talk after me that Annie would uh, talk about homeschooling. Um, the thing with homeschooling, uh, unrelated to um, unrelated to, to the topic of language, we're talking about uh, online testing, online language assessment, and uh, that of course now has to happen at home. Uh, colleagues uh, of mine from the UK tried to measure, to estimate level of noise uh, in homes, and level of noise in homes can be really really high depending on on of course uh, the, how many people are in the household and what they are doing but uh, for language acquisition and language learning that can be really detrimental in the sense that we know that a constant background noise in, impairs uh, language acquisition so that is like if you have a radio on all day and try to having conversations over that, or having TV on all a day, or different people are listening to different uh, media and trying to talk at the same time, and then ch child uh, um, tries to acquire language in, in that noisy setting. Um, also, the, the thing is like, if you, if you let's say Google uh, homeschooling, what comes up are all of these uh, lovely pictures of one parent sitting with one child on a very neat and tidy kind of uh, environment, clean desk, um, a lovely laptop on, on, on it, and they are kind of homeschooling together. That is not uh, the reality. In reality, it's kind of um, parents are trying to, to uh, do their work from home, uh, there are multiple children, there might be only one laptop at home or maybe no computer at home, they're working from their phones. Um, you know, multiple siblings talking together, watching TV, uh, eating, uh, doing all sorts of things, maybe all being in the same room. And, and these conditions are far from, uh, from ideal. So that is also something that um, contributes to, to language acquisition. Um, 
So what, what do we do? How do we deal with this, this problem? So let's say if I'm an immigrant parent and my language, uh, my English uh, uh, levels are not high and I have few kids and noisy household, how do I deal with that? Um, the, the thing is we know that there is transfer uh, of metalinguistic abilities across languages. So uh, what is important is to communicate with children and to teach children to communicate. Of course, if you can do that in two languages, that's fantastic. But if you can't, then maybe focus on the language in which you can. Uh, it is really important to devote time to talking, to talk one to one. So directly uh, talk to your child and don't issue orders, but kind of uh, try to uh, support communication. Another thing is try to support narratives or so storytelling. Um, if there is a little event, let's say someone dropped a glass and glass broke on the floor, ask the child what happened. Encourage the child to tell someone else what happened, why did it happen, who wanted to do what, uh, who was the, the, the agent and so on. So. Uh, um, if the child has those bases, it's much easier than to add words from a different language, uh, if necessary. Uh, in order to support English, uh, what, what could be helpful is, for example, audiobooks, where the child will see the text and then hear the native speaker uh, talking about that. And then you can talk about uh, what was read uh, in English or in different language but uh, trying to kind of uh, get the child to think about the story, about the plot, about understanding what they read, excuse me, and what was in the story. Uh, one other thing that I would like to uh, mention in the end uh, is that, uh, and, and that generally applies to, to equally to Irish and to immigrant languages and to monolingual English speakers, is the problem of um, speech and language therapy uh, services currently almost uh, not working at all. Uh, speech and language therapists are generally uh, deployed to um, COVID testing. And this is one thing. The other thing is because of the, the social distancing, uh, most services are closed and don't see clients. There is some um, advancement now made on the front of uh, uh, telehealth, but basically that generally affects all of the services. That, that's all for me. Thank you, Sasha. An interesting perspective there. And we move on to Annie. So, Annie, if you're ready, um, okay. of course. Thanks so much, Tasha. There's uh, quite a lot of crossover there between our talks. Thanks so much for having me. Um, first of all, to introduce myself, I'm Annie Asgard and I'm a, a primary school teacher in Clada National School, which is just here in Galway City. It's a Jesh Band 1 urban school. Um, I'm an EAL teacher, which for those of you who are unfamiliar means I'm an English language support teacher. And at the moment, I work in a job sharing capacity with my partner, Maureen Brown. So at our school, we have over 30 different uh, unique home languages. Um, and so that's a huge amount of linguistic diversity. And so quite a lot of teachers would worry that, you know, I, I can't do that job, Annie. How can I do that? I don't speak all those languages. Um, so we're pleased to see that as part of the new primary language curriculum, for the first time, linguistic diversity, in addition to English and Irish, has been mentioned, although tangentially, in my own opinion, um, so a lot has been published um, just to, in the last months about the digital divide in terms of uh, children's socioeconomic background um, and, and other challenges. So I'd like to focus specifically on language um, because that's obviously my area and that's the unique perspective that I will bring to the talk. So the first thing that we did when we, myself and Maureen, sat down immediately after the schools closed was we thought, right, what do we do from here? And what we did was we sent a survey to the parents of the children uh, who we 
serve. And we asked them what sorts of worries they had. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, we asked them, are you worried about English language loss? So some of them were and some of them weren't and they had their own resources. Um, so we asked them what support they needed. So we offered a various menu of supports that they could have. Some of them chose to just continue on with the lessons they had in the classroom with the class teacher. Some of them wanted thematic links that would be very hands off for the parents that they could just put in thematic language videos, chants, songs and rhymes. Others wanted Zoom lessons. So we're gonna be looking at a Zoom lesson in a minute. I'll give you a little bit of background. So before I show you the clip, I want to make sure for those of you who are concerned that the consent of the parent was achieved as was the assent of the child and they're both hopefully watching now in their home. Um, and so the language, the home language of the child that you'll be seeing is Arabic. Um, he does speak uh, English quite well and does speak English at school with his friends and he um, but he does for the last four months or three, three and a half months has been speaking exclusively Arabic. So we have been um, having Zoom lessons at home with the family. He has a sibling as well. Um, and so what you'll be seeing in the video is a maths lesson um, in geometry. And it's very, very content driven. And uh, obviously the content that this child would, be, would have been exposed to in the classroom was purely through English. Um, and the content language that he would be exposed to, he's never learned in his L1. Um, this particular child's mother, very, very um, importantly, does teach in a heritage language school. So in order to, I, I feel, in order to really achieve true uh, plurilingualism in primary schools in Ireland, we need to start connecting with groups like Mother Tongues Ireland. I'll be mm -hmm. posting all these links now in an attachment. Um, with the heritage schools so that we are certain that the children who are multilingual are learning the same types of CLIL language, so content language, in, in all of the languages that they speak. So not just learning, for example, you'll see in the video, vertices, edges, corners, and angles, and that language, not just learning it in the target language, in our case English, but also in their mother tongue. Um, so we used what, in the video you're going to see, we used what is available in the environment, and because myself and my colleague, Ms. Brown, have developed really strong relationships with the families and with the children. We've invested that time when we were on site at school. Now that we're in the children's homes and they're in our homes and that blurred line of um, the, the kind of borders and the, the boundaries that we have, you know, that's, that's a certain uh, relationship that we've now developed. So you'll see that at one point in the video, I asked the child to go to a part of the house and get get a box um, and I, I come, uh, you know, the, all of that kind of relationship that I have and the mom goes and gets the box, you're going to see this in a minute. Um, it's all about relationships and relationships with the family. We're not just teaching the child, we're inviting the parent to participate with us in, in a partnership and that's extremely important. Um, so you'll see as part of the video then, I speak my own home language, which is Farsi, um, and I'm modeling uh, bilingualism and plurilingualism for the child. And then he and I together construct Irish because Irish isn't one of my languages and I'm, I'm working on that and he's working on that. And you know, it's a difficult task for him to come here and learn English and learn Irish at the same time. So I encourage him and we get through the Irish together. You'll see rather awkwardly at times. So hold back the criticism. But um, I also mentioned another friend of his who he hasn't been able to see during the school closure, who's, who speaks another home language. And I ask him, does he know that that child's, how to count in that child's language? And he says, no, but his sister does. So we're talking about all different people and the different languages they speak and how important they are. So I just want to, for the moment, I want to say, um, for those teachers who might be watching who are EAL teachers and are wondering, how am I supposed to know all of these things? There's no training in the Department of Education, which is true. There's no CPD for teachers. And I'd like to point you out to a really good resource, which is the TEAL uh, Ireland Facebook group. And there's two moderators there called Livia and Joan. I'd like to just commend them for providing support for EAL teachers on developing multilingualism in our students. They're, one is a primary school teacher, that's Joan, and uh, Livia is a secondary school teacher, and they've been providing support for teachers um, on the Facebook group for a very long time. So please go and have a visit there. Um, and again, I mentioned Mother Tongues Ireland is very supportive as well. So just moving down there, um, I'm going to show the video now. So just give me one moment. Here we go. 
looking for. Now, thank you. Now, can you hold it up for me? Good boy. Now, that one's a little bit different because it's not exactly square, but we're just going to pretend yeah. for the minute, okay? That's actually this shape down here called a cuboid, but we're just going to pretend for the minute, okay? So do you remember we learned this word down here called vertices? And I showed you that that word vertices has what letter that's special about it? Um, what letter is special about the word vertices? Is it the corners. The corners, because it's the special letter V for V, V, and the letter V, V, V is very pointy, and yeah. that pointy bit of it is like the corners of your box. So I want you to try to count on that T box how many vertices or pointy corners it has. Can you try? Go ahead, oh, hold it up for me so I can help you and I can see. One over here, two. Hold it up like three. for the camera. Actually, um, Laith, can you put your camera down a bit so I can see the box? Yeah, there we go, that's better. Okay, Four. how many vertices or corners are on that cube? Hmm. Eight. Can you count them for me one by one? One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Now, I want to see if you can do it for me in Arabic. Count, count to eight in Arabic. Now, will I do it in my language for you? Okay, ready? Here we go. I've got to put up eight fingers. Yek, do, se, chahar, panj, shish. Haft, hasht. Do you think you can do it in Irish? I'll do it with you. A hain, a do, a, hain, do, a tray, yeah, a gahu, ku, a kui, yeah. Uh, Starts with sh, ah, yeah, ah, yeah. Ah. One more. You can do it. Oh, that's eight. You're right. Exactly. Mahu. Do you know any other languages? No. Leonos. Do you know Diego's language? No. Leonos. Leia knows it. Maybe I'll ask Leia to help me later. Okay. Can you write the eight in? Okay. So back to me then. Um, all right, so um, just there, and you saw in the video, there's quite a lot to unpack there, and I don't have all day, so I'm sure they're probably thinking she can hurry up. Just some implications I wanted to go through um, as we look forward now. There was a, a very important announcement that um, there's, there's quite a lot of challenges for us uh, going forward about opening schools. Um, and I wanted to just touch on uh, a piece of research by w Rory McDade in Marino uh, Institute of Education with regards to using um, dual language resources. I think that's really one of the ways forward that we can, we can look at um, so that parents of children who are uh, maybe don't have the English language competence that's necessary or the language literacy that's necessary, as, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and another thing, too, I, I would like to mention Deirdre Kerwin did a very, very important piece of work um, on embracing linguistic diversity. Uh, that was a book that was published in January 2019. So I'll be, pub I'll be putting those up there. But one of the really, really important pieces myself, I, I learned English when I went to school was, I think, um, the affective implications of children and how we receive their various languages. Um, as you notice, my encouraging of this child's Irish um, isn't always the way that children's attempts at language are received. And if I immediately went in and started correcting all the mistakes that he was making, um, he wouldn't be long kind of giving up. Um, so I think that you know, in terms of our school policies and our school approaches, we need to start looking as a department um, at a very pluralistic plan 
in terms of a plural, a plural linguistic plan in terms of how we approach language. And that includes English and Irish. So a lot of schools address that by just making a sign or some signs in the school that say welcome and they just write it welcome in all the different languages that are represented in the school. And that's kind of where it stops. So I think we really need to, to have a very, very strong um, think about how we can include all of the language, not just the ones that are represented in certain diverse schools, but, but all of the languages and not just in urban Jesh Band One schools. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and I hope that was interesting for you. And if you have any questions, I'll be putting up some details. You can contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wani. If you could stop sharing your screen now. And thank you for that um, really uplifting video <laughs> and a positive um, perspective. And, uh, and finally, the last um, panelist, uh, Dr. Cassie Smith Christmas. So Cassie, if you're uh, ready, uh, it's over to you now. Yes, uh, thanks so much. Um, so first of all, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. And I must say, um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to draw on the previous talks. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, in, this, in thinking about this seminar, we wanted to highlight um, the challenges, but then the sort of silver linings um, of this very difficult time, but what we can use in taking um, in going further, um, going forward in a world that is now reopening, but is nonetheless, um, to borrow William Butler Yeats's word, um, changed, changed utterly. And so um, I should emphasize in my talk here that um, the positive aspects that I'm talking about weren't necessarily absent um, from family life before the time of COVID-19, but rather COVID-19 offered me as a researcher a quite unique vantage point um, to see and reflect on these positive aspects. And so this research is part of a Mary Skodowska Curry Fellowship um, that seeks to more, learn more about family life um, and language in Galway. And so it um, draws on the experiences of um, families who use a minority language in the home. And the main methodology is that the families get um, tablets and they're asked to record a language diary. And then once a month, um, I talk to them about their language diaries and we have this discussion. And so before um, the lockdown, um, this was in person, I'd go to their houses, but of course, um, now it's over, um, over various channels of um, virtual communication. Um, so one of the things that I'm going to be talking about, and this um, draws very much on what um, Stasha was saying earlier, and then we saw in action with Annie's um, video clip, is that the home now um, has a new meaning. The home is now simultaneously still the home, um, but it's also people's workplace, and it's also the classroom. Um, so I don't mean to downplay in any way the challenges that um, people face because of this, but rather to, to take it and to look at it in terms of um, the bright spot, spot, the bright spot of, of potentially blurring these boundaries in potentially facilitating the child's positive emotional relationship with the language. And especially in the cases where children might associate the minority language primarily with school. And I'm talking mainly um, in an Irish context here, um, whether the child goes to a girls school or um, to, to a mainstream, to a school where um, Irish is taught as a subject. But this idea that the language can be thought of as a school language. Now, Ireland is not unique at all um, in this aspect. I've been, um, thinking about this um, since the work I did in the Hebrides of Scotland, um, where I worked with families who were um, trying very hard to transmit their language, Scottish Gaelic, um, to the youngest members of their family. Um, but it wasn't working very well. And one day um, when the child was asked why she didn't use more Gaelic in the home, she just looked at us and said, because I'm not in school. And um, so that is an issue. 
So I think one of the things, and this is one of the things that I may be seeing in the videos um, that the families and, um, are sending me is the potential for the blurred boundary between the school and the home to sort of delaminate this association and to give parents the latitude to creatively integrate Irish more strongly into the home in different ways. And in, especially in terms of input. Now, Stasha was talking about um, that in terms of input, that um, rather than just um, say, do this, do that, put your shoes on, that um, what encourages language use is, is things like narratives, things like engagement and asking children's questions. And particularly, um, I think the main, the main point is that the child, um, to acquire and use a language, the child has to have a very positive emotional relationship with language. So using the home um, as this um, sort of space, safe space within which to use the language. So this idea came to me from one of the families that I have the absolute pleasure of working with. Um, now, now, this family is, is an Irish speaking family. The, the father um, speaks Irish to the children, the mother speaks English. They're following the one parent, one language strategy in their home. Um, but, but the girls often answer in English. But in one of the sessions that um, we were doing over video, um, the girl was, was showing me her vegetables all the vegetables that she was growing. And she was very, very proud of, of these vegetables. And she told me all their names in Irish. And what was clear to me was not only was she learning vocabulary that maybe she didn't um, use in school that much, but that she was really enjoying using the language. And I started wondering is the fact that now, okay, school is a skoelga, but also home life is a squelga. Is there more? Um, is there more space for um, the school language to be used in a more fun, playful way in the home? And I think that's what's happening with with the family. Well, what I see anyway is the enjoyment from the children of the language. So another point. So besides building this, this um, quite good emotional relationship with the language um, and thinking about going for, forward, um, I think there's also the opportunity, and, and Annie touched on this, this is um, talked about in the new curriculum and then in the Odwir and Cummings report as well, the idea of um, connection synergies across languages and to um, not only valorize the parents' own multilingual competencies, but um, to foster metalinguistic awareness in the children. So understanding things across languages. And I've seen this uh, very clearly in, in one of the families that I work with. This is um, a Polish, a family who uses Polish as their home, home language. And in one of our online sessions, the daughter who was six, um, she, she read me a book in Polish. Now, I don't speak Polish, so um, her father then translated. And um, now normally, of course, the, the, uh, normally the daughter would attend a complimentary Polish Saturday school, um, which is a key support for her literacy development in her home language. This, of course, now is the remit of the parents, but what I've seen in the case of these particular parents is that they're thriving and they're supporting their daughter's literacy across languages and um, so Polish English and some Irish as well um, which again points to the potential positive aspects of home language learning in the time of COVID the fact that many parents will be speakers of both the home language and English thus allowing them more time for learning across the languages than may be possible um, in your your traditional mainstream school um, then finally, um, I'd like to emphasize the potential um, for us to think more about children's agency and play-based learning in conjunction with language learning and language maintenance. So an Irish speaking family mentioned beforehand in looking through their videos, it appears that art has featured very strongly in the children's language learning. So the father 
valorizes the child's agency by letting them draw what they want, but then asking them a number of follow-up questions, much the way that Stasha um, talked about um, the importance of follow-up questions. You know, what happened, what's going on, building a narrative through something. So they have agency, but they're, then they're encouraged to use the home language. Um, and then in the Polish family, one of the things that I thought was so cute in our little discussions online is um, I asked the girl, what's the best thing about lockdown? And she said, getting to play with my mommy and daddy. Now, this isn't to imply at all that the parents um, didn't play with her or um, that the, the Irish-speaking children didn't um, do art beforehand, but rather that this is um, a space for again, going back to the idea of input and the importance of positive affect of, um, of a way that um, the children's home language can uh, be seen as something very valuable and something very enjoyable. And then finally, just to end with one more sort of um, vignette um, from these little snapshots of family life, um, speaking of play, and the idea of learning is that in one of the videos that the Irish families, Irish speaking family sent me, this, the two girls are playing shop with their dolls. And the younger girl comes in wanting to buy a pair of underwear for her doll, as you do. And the older daughter sells her the other underwear and they're speaking English this whole time. But then the, the older daughter very proudly says, and the brand name is Nabrashtini which means underwear in Irish. Um, so then the father who's been videoing asks the girls what they're doing and the older girl proudly explains to him about the new doll underwear brand, Nabrashtini. So this is, it's a tiny example of Irish language use, but to me, it shows the very creative and agentative way that children are using language and how we can think about this going forward. Forward. What have we seen that has been good in children's language learning and home? And how can we incorporate this um, into schools more? Now, no, these are not radically new ideas. Again, um, they're, they're in the new curriculum, in the Adrier and Cummings report. Um, and there's also been several videos that highlight these, um, such as the mother tongues video. And then you will also see it in the Two Small, which is the family support program in Corcoquina in their videos. And I see these videos them, themselves as another bright spot. So just to end um, on, a, on looking at a, a hopeful way of going forward that hopefully that what we can take from this is um, the importance of facilitating the child's positive emotional relationship with the language through valorizing their agency and creativity and for children building children's metalinguistic awareness across the different languages so thank you very much for listening um, thank you very much to the families who have um, so so generously shared their lives with me. Um, and Thanks so much. Thank you, Cassie. It's nice to finish with these creative multilingual children who uh, strike a very positive note. Um, we have some questions here. So if the speakers would like to turn on their um, microphones and videos um, and uh, some of the questions, uh, we have some came through earlier. Um, I think the first one, which is actually a question in two uh, parts, so two related questions, um, it's probably mainly for, uh, for John, but I'm sure the, the other panelists might want to, uh, may have something to add. So um, it's referring to the weakness of um, state bilingualism and is asking, Though the weakness of state bilingualism in a time of crisis may be regrettable, could the community response to the emergency become a model of civic engagement and positive language-based activism in the future? And following on from that, could the community's response to the health crisis inform state language policy in a positive and progressive manner? Well, I'll just, I think it probably covers what I said and what everybody else said, what really, especially Annie and Cassie were looking at was community responses. 
I think, um, or responses on the ground. And yes, there's an awful lot that we should learn from them. And, and every policy should be informed by community responses. And there's absolutely so much important and good work going on. Um, so yes, there's a, you know, a, a, at a macro level, things are very monolingual and very grim. Um, you know, there are obviously practical limits to what can be provided by the state in any multilingual situation, but certainly the monolingual approach is, is not appropriate in, 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 in the settings in which we live. But I think that, you know, the examples that we've had from Cassie's families, from, from, from Annie's school kids, are precisely the examples of the, of the support. And indeed, the, I know that for Stasha that the SLT is largely suspended at the moment, but indeed there's a lot of very important work going on there too. These are not things that are happening in isolation from the state entirely. Family language pol policy is perhaps slightly different. It's more autonomous in its own sense, but it's shaped by the school language policy and their approaches as well. So I'll just let the others in then. I might uh, just pop in there very quickly. I think um, the Department of Education is quite uh, reluctant to hand sort of ready-made policies of any kind really to schools. Um, and with regards to, to language policy and certainly with regards to um, quite specifically um, policies about where different home languages or mother tongues can be spoken. Um, there was quite an interesting post made on Voice for Teachers, which is a forum on Facebook for teachers, where one teacher said, do you know that, that they had a policy in their own school where they wouldn't allow children to speak and they used the language Polish as an example in the corridors at school um, and that there was an English only policy. And there was quite a, a, a very, very wide range of responses from teachers about how they felt about this. Um, you know, everything from, you know, this is a human rights violation to, you know, this is a school, we can decide what languages we will accept and which ones we won't. And I think that there isn't a real space in schools for these types of open discussions to be had. And, and there isn't, we don't have that type of language, although we, we are a bilingual country, um, that type of open space for discussion and debate isn't, um, isn't open to us. And we don't have people to facilitate or a facility to have those discussions. And so when, when policies in general in schools are um, debated and discussed, oftentimes there's a very small number of people involved and it's passed on then to a board of management who ratify it on an annual basis and that's kind of the end of it. And I'm coming from a very practical point of view and so while there might be a larger language policy that is um, established on a national level, by the time it filters down to the practical child in the corridor, I think it loses a lot of its steam, if you know what I mean. Um, and so because I'm obviously a practitioner here, I'm not an academic, I, I think that that's where that gap seems to happen somewhere. And so I think that, um, and, and that's also with Irish too, do you know? Um, so one of the questions that someone raised was, if you, if you were in a, in a, in a not a, a Guelph school and you saw two children speaking Irish and going down the corridor to each other outside of an Irish lesson, you would be delighted you know, and so um, that that was the the kind of thing that switched the conversation around. So it was just an interesting observation there. Thanks. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, mother tongue initiative. It's nice to see that. Obviously, that is a private uh, initiative, but it's nice to see it um, taking off uh, really and doing so well. Um, if there are no other comments, there, there is another question. Um, an interesting um, in the presentation by the Department of Health and the Taoiseach about COVID was that interpretation was given in Irish sign language, but that there was no Irish language interpretation. So this showed a willingness of the state to be inclusive, but not inclusive enough to have the Irish language included. So what do you think is the reason for this? Maybe. Um, all the speakers may have something to add to this, well, something to say in this regard. Do you want me to comment, uh, um, Laura, or? Yes, go ahead, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I mean, I think the, um, I mean, inclusivity is, is one of those terms that can be 
um, very uh, misused, I think. Um, you know, certain things can be deemed worthy of inclusion and others not. And I'm not under, uh, undermining the importance at all of using Irish Sign Language, but, and it has been very consistently used, which is very good. But I think it stands in contrast to the provision of public health information in, in Irish and in, in heritage languages or immigrant languages, absolutely, the, the evidence is there. Um, I'm not suggesting, nobody's suggesting that, you know, 10, verse, 10 language versions of press conferences be provided. I'm talking about very basic, very simple and very quite limited in terms of text, uh, public health information. The public health information is not extremely extensive and long and it doesn't contain thousands and thousands and thousands of words. You're talking about signage, booklets, you know, ads in newspapers, uh, you know, videos online. It's, 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 it's pretty simple stuff. It's, 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 not, it's not rocket science to, to, to produce it. And uh, it, it's noticeable by its absence. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, okay, so we move on because I'm also conscious of time. There is a question, uh, this in particular for Stasha. Is there an opportunity during COVID-19 to develop new speech and language therapy tools, which are online, that could then go beyond this period and be helpful to those in remote areas or those who require more specialist help, which is largely centered in urban locations? Um, yes, is the answer to that question. And uh, I mean, this is what we see as a silver line, lining and a great opportunity to actually promote telehealth, which is something that we had tried to promote about 10 years ago, but it was really difficult. It required specific equipment. In particular, we tried to do that with Iron Islands. And to provide speech and language therapy, but that was at the time technology wasn't really that good. So what we have now is that basically almost every single person in Ireland uh, has at least a mobile phone. And I think that this is a great opportunity to move some proportion, not all, but some proportion of speech and language therapy to telehealth. Because if you think that there is someone who has four kids at home and uh, like, I don't know, an hour to travel to the, the clinic and hour to travel back and so on, or an old person who, who uh, is not mobile or has difficult, uh, kind of difficulties with mobility, Telehealth is is perfect solution for that. And our colleagues in Australia use it a lot. In Canada, they use it a lot. And this is what we are at the moment doing behind the scenes. And also uh, Irish Association of Speech and Language Therapists currently has intensive uh, seminars and workshops so that that service is brought to, to speech and language therapy and hopefully it stays beyond COVID. Thank you. And moving on again. Um, again, this is question is specifically for uh, Cassie. Uh, what do you make of a report out today from Conquer or Collingen? Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this uh, decently. That there were immense challenges in reversing language shift in the Western Isles especially the prediction that Gaelic speaking communities will vanish within 10 years? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting question. I was actually one of the field researchers um, for the, the communities component um, for, the, uh, for the project. So um, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Um, I worked on the island of Scalpe with that project and um, and yes, it, it was very difficult to see a community in which the people spoke the language together, um, but they were all quite elderly. So it was the language that they used all the time, but they were quite elderly. Um, since then, though, I have had the opportunity to go back and work with one of the families, um, one of the, the few families who... Um, who, but one of the few families on the island, really, is the way to put it. And um, they're raising their daughters with Gaelic. Um, the problem is, of course, the, um, the economic um, problems, the, very, the number of challenges in, in being 
in that particular area. So um, I hope that um, from this, there will be more focus on community development. Thank you. Um, there are some comments uh, as well coming in. Um, Annie in particular, there are many schools who award certificates weekly for uh, information, uh, informal Irish speaking. Uh, and yet there are children who are banned from their own language at all. Um, and some thank you notes as well. Um, well. I might just pick up on that. I, yes. I, know, I know you mentioned there, Laura, about the uh, Mother Tongues Ireland. Um, just uh, Francesca de la Morga was just a huge um, influence and a huge advocate for uh, multilingualism. And um, I know she's working very, very hard to promote a project called Language Explorers in Schools. And you know, she doesn't really receive any departmental support. Um, so I would just like to give um, my personal support and I'm sure Cassie and John and, and, and Stasha and everybody else would, would also um, add that support. So it, I think if schools, uh, I've, I've been part of a couple different groups where teachers say, you know, we're gonna put up the signs that say welcome in the languages that are represented in our own school. And I think that that's where really the limitations stop because that means that if you live in a small village like I do, maybe where there isn't a huge diversity of languages, they just focus on Polish, for example, because there's only Polish in my school. So all of the kids can say hello in Polish and that's the end of that. And we think that the whole world is Poland. Um, so I think that it's a project or program, sorry, like Language Explorers can really open up the world and to, to sort of get that that cohort of teachers who are of a certain, like myself, quite old, um, to sort of think that the children that you're teaching won't necessarily stay in your village or in your county or even in your province or maybe even in Ireland and to sort of open up the world and, and to use that capacity to speak in English and in Irish and to expand that further. Um, and so there are existing programs like that. It's just that it's not coming from the Department of Education. So yes. uh, yeah, I think that that's, that's what I would say is it really comes back to sort of retroactively going back to the teachers who were in service at the time and then the pre-service ITE teachers um, and sort of giving them that plurilingual lens um, to look at the curriculum through that lens. Um, that, that would be my, my sort of... So Can I just add, um, yeah. Laura, and I mean, yes. I'll just say very briefly, we can't underestimate the power of the monolingual ideology in Ireland. I mean, it's, this is the backdrop to all of our work. Uh, and not really, just really, in Ireland. <laughs> well, absolutely, of course not. But I, we have to resist this. You know, this has to be yeah, resisted. Absolutely, absolutely. Stasha, I want to come in there. I just wanted to, to stress out that uh, what, I don't know whether that clearly came out in my, in my uh, talk, but uh, the currently, because of COVID, situation is shifted and children are staying at home and, as Kasi said, staying and playing and learning at home with their parents in their heritage languages. So this will kind of give a huge boost now to, to those languages. Uh, and formal education through English will go down. So uh, the, what, what we need to think about is how do we keep both? Because it's not, uh, mm. uh, of course, we, we don't want monolingual uh, culture and monolingual dominance. We want to encourage language diversity. And within English, we want to encourage different ways of expressing yourself. Um, and, you know, recently, I mean, I was thinking like, okay, you can say that Oxford English is the, the golden standard. But what is wrong with, let's say, I don't know, New York vernacular or, or traveler's language? That, that's not any less language. It's just a different version of it. So we want to encourage uh, diversity within English and across different languages and to keep, uh, but not, not to kind of suppress English. We want, we want to kind of encourage everything, all languages that, that the child uh, uh, can be exposed to and maybe to your field Laura now a bit in second language learning I think that that's another 
another thing that uh, can be quite detrimental in this COVID situation, because let's say if I was studying Italian and I now am not exposed to Italian, I don't have my, my classes stopped. I don't have anyone to speak to. Or let's say my, my son uh, who studies French, he was in Paris on his Erasmus and had to, had to come back. So his language exposure is cut for some three, four months, I don't know, uh, in that country. So that, that is a huge impact and we need to think about how to support uh, people in those situations as well. Yes, the online tools <laughs> uh, in this case uh, do come in handy. Um, you know, to a certain extent. Um, just two more questions as we're running, uh, well, it's 10 past five already. Um, one again, uh, Annie was following on from what you were saying before. Um, glad to see uh, your example video of a family that really supports the bilingualism of their child. Are there any families you are working with that, uh, that have a more negative view of multilingualism? For example, a family that might not wish for their child to cultivate the ability in their home or heritage language. If this were the case, would you continue to encourage the child's multilingualism? Or would you change your approach to focus more on English? Interesting uh, ethical question here. Yeah, I mean, I, I have in the past had families um, who say for whatever reason, and it's none of my business to ask, we are never going back to that country leave the country blank um, because they had a bad experience in that country. And, you know, again, it's going back to the relationship of building trust with the family and explaining to them that uh, despite the fact that they may not go back, the child may in the future want to go back and have a relationship either with the country, this, their family or some relations or friends um, and that I explain to them how the brain develops at a very young age if the child is to become bilingual and that that will help them later on in their academic life mm -hmm. to learn you know other languages including Irish and some modern foreign language that's taught at second level so um, I have worked around it but uh, it's it's a trust kind of thing that develops over time but obviously I can't I can't force anyone but um, you know I <laughs> <laughs> it is it, it has happened in the past um with with ourselves but i think the I main the main thing is that not everyone goes to the mother the the heritage language schools on saturdays and develops literacy and numeracy some in their home language some of them just opt for the the basic chats and and that's okay too you know um you kind of have to meet the families where they are and move on from there so well it's interesting because uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, Stasha, you were saying something. Yes. I just wanted to, to point what Cassie said earlier on, that uh, emotional relationship with the language, emotions towards language play a large part. And uh, I think that this is partly, uh, uh, you know, we need to encourage parents if they feel comfortable, more comfortable in their language and they express emotions better and they are kind of uh, have a better emotional relationship with their child in their language to you. But then again, as this, this example said, it could be that parents had some really intensive negative uh, experiences through that language and that they simply don't wish to, to you know, that that just reminds them of their negative experiences. And that's why they don't want to speak those languages. And that's fine again, or children have the same, the same uh, experience. Yeah, and especially as they grow up and uh, become teenagers, then there may be different uh, um, emotional uh, feelings towards the uh, the home language, and the feel of being the feeling of being different from others. So yes, it's a, it's an interesting uh, perspective, very very um, uh, complex. And we take one more question. Uh, this particular for you, John. Uh, any thoughts on what appears to be a growth in online Irish language conversation groups since COVID-19? For example, Sina G, uh, Let's Learn Irish, and so on. Yeah, I mean, there's been a growth of everything online, so it's not surprising that there be Irish language groups as well. I mean, we need an Irish language digital strategy, a uh, digital media strategy as well. Um, you know, to cover the online world as well as the physical world. Um, and, you know, definitely this needs to be fostered more. 
um, as th things have inevitably shifted online more and more of the world will, you know, take place online, at least in countries that are relatively well off, like Ireland, where people can afford to the, the connections and the equipment and so on. And in that case, in all minority languages will need more online support as well. Absolutely. There's been plenty of interesting stuff going on. We need to foster that in Irish and in all of the other languages spoken. Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm just trying to read <laughs> uh, something that's just come in. Um, okay, this is particularly for uh, for Annie. Um, looking for an, uh, an email address for you, so you might want to answer I'm, privately I, I, to a particular question. Yeah, I I don't know what the best way to do that is. Um, I had a document that had all the references um, that were available that I that I put up just the articles and the the different things. So I don't know what the best way to share that is. Okay, I can just send you the, the you email. The, yeah, you can share it to, to, to the chat yeah, yeah. Okay. to everybody. Yeah. And if you okay. want, with the individual person, you could uh, send them your email individually okay. through the attendees list. Um, if you click on the person's okay. name. Well, actually, what I'll do now is I can um, just very quickly, while you're saying your goodbyes and thank yous, I can just make it a Google Doc and share it very quickly, which has my email address on it. Um, I think there are no more questions, and uh, um, so it just want, I just want to uh, thank you all uh, for uh, taking part, and thank you again to those who are following on uh, Flirt FM, and thank you to our speakers and uh, to the Moore Institute, and also to David Kelly, who helped us with the uh, technology here today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Oh, just one second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just posted that link to the Google Docs that has my email address on it. Just yes, I see it there. Yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs>